do snipers work? There's probably nothing more mythologized and romanticized than the sniper, and there's probably nobody more misunderstood. In 2015, when the movie American Sniper was released, filmmaker Michael Moore said, my uncle killed by sniper in World War II, we were taught snipers were cowards, we'll shoot you in the back, snipers aren't heroes and invaders are worse. But believe it or not, a sniper is much more likely to call on artillery than shoot you in the back. Or do you remember that quote from Saving Private Ryan? I wouldn't venture out there, fellas. This sniper's got talent. Well, if that sniper had talent, he wouldn't have been hiding in such an obvious place, and he wouldn't have targeted such a low-ranking soldier. Or from the movie The Shooter. Suppose I was looking for a man to make a 2200-yard cold war shot. Who's alive that could do that? Nobody. The truth is that Everything you think you know about snipers is probably wrong. I spent a few days at Fort Benning, Georgia, talking to snipers from all over the world at the International Sniper Competition, including U.S. Army sniper instructors. Now, traveling down to Fort Benning wasn't cheap, and when I go, I pay for things out of my own pocket. So give me about a minute here to pay the bills. This video is sponsored by Ridge. Click the link in the description below. Go to ridge.com slash Macbeth. Get your dad an awesome gift for Father's Day. I absolutely love my Ridge wallet. This thing holds up to 12 cards. It holds my Tesla key. It holds cash. It's RFID blocking to stop digital pickpocketers. The key case helps prevent my keys from jingling when I go running. If you've ever given or gotten a lousy Father's Day gift, now is the time to make amends. It comes in a multitude of colors, including orange, which is my favorite, and alpine blue, which is my second favorite. And best of all, this wallet can be good for your health. It actually eliminated my back pain when I was diagnosed with wallet neurotitis, because now I can put this wallet in my front pocket. So click the link in the description below, go to ridge.com slash Macbeth and get your dad an amazing gift for Father's Day. Now, when I went down to Fort Benning, I got a chance to speak to a lot of snipers from all over the world. And what I saw were not supermen. I didn't see these steely-eyed super soldiers. I saw guys who were really disciplined and really good at math. A good sniper can't work alone. They have to be good at working a team. It's the most important trait of a sniper. It's not sociopathy, it's teamwork and resilience. And even though Tom Berenger says, one shot, one kill, no exceptions. The truth is that if you do have to shoot, you're far more likely to shoot, adjust, and shoot again using the data from your first shot to make your second shot land where it's supposed to go. The one quote I kept hearing from sniper instructors and snipers themselves is the bullet stays downrange. This means that once that shot is fired, the sniper doesn't dwell on a miss. They're already lining up the next shot. I actually asked snipers what made them a good sniper, and I kept hearing thick skin, no ego, ego out the door. Even the Saudis said the word samud, which kind of means resilient. And not once did anybody ever say that a sniper has to be a good shot with a rifle. And when you think about it, a sniper is going to be a good shot with a rifle. If you have good data on wind and range and a good rifle, you just dial that information in and pull that trigger. I could teach an NPR reporter to hit a man-sized target out to 800 meters with the right optics and a good rifle. Yeah, anybody could do it. But that being said, everybody wants to be a sniper. But nobody wants to put on 120 pounds of equipment, walk 20 miles, and wait five days for a target that may or may not show up, and then walk back and get chewed out by your commander. So yeah, resiliency. Resiliency makes a good sniper. The term sniper actually goes back to the British occupation of India, where the snipe was a marsh-dwelling game bird that was exceptionally difficult to hit due to its erratic flight. Over the years, they've been called different things, such as marksmen or sharpshooters. During the American Revolution, such soldiers were considered to be very unsporting by British officers that they would target. Around the 1860s, during the American Civil War, telescopic sights began to appear in both the Union and Confederate hands. In fact, one Confederate sniper account stated, A regiment of the enemy crossed the Liberty Church Road in full view at a distance of about 1,300 hands. Eight or ten men left the ranks of the regiment to enter a garden on the roadside and began to help themselves to a mess of potatoes. While the Yankees were thus engaged and had gathered around some particularly productive spot, I directed Sergeant Hill to fire at them with the elevation required for 1,300 yards. 
The party left the garden precipitately, bearing off with them a wounded comrade, and in their haste forgot to carry off the potatoes. Now, a 1,300-yard shot would be a difficult shot even today, but you can see how even then, a sniper was a force multiplier that could punch way above their weight. Now, today, snipers don't work alone or even in pairs. Rather, they operate in teams of three, sniper, spotter, and team lead. Now, I'm about to talk about the weapons each member carries, but note, the weapon systems may change based on the unit or the mission. The sniper typically carries the Barrett MRAD M22. This is a bolt-action sniper rifle that comes in three calibers, 338 Norma Magnum, 300 Norma Magnum, and 762 by 51 NATO. The rifle can be configured in these three different calibers to make maximum use of available ammunition, although 762 by 51 is typically used as a training round due to its lower cost. Now, when talking about rifle scopes, the number to the left of the X is the magnification power and sometimes there'll be a dash and another number showing you its minimum and its maximum magnification the second number after the x is the objective lens or the size of the lens closest to the target the mrad m22 is equipped with a leopold mark 5 hd 7 to 35 by 56 rifle scope which costs about 2200 dollars this means the magnification power can go from 7 power to 35 power, and the objective lens diameter is 56 millimeters. The MRAD is topped off by a Storm SLX rangefinder that costs about $9,000. Many of these rifles also come with suppressors, which are almost always wrapped in the thermal sleeve. This helps prevent heat mirage from obstructing the shooter's view when firing. The spotter carries an M151 12 to 40 by 60 spotter scope and an M110 rifle chambered in 762 by 51. This M110 rifle is semi-automatic and it gives the team the ability to gain volume of fire in a close fight. The rifle is equipped with a Leopold 5HD 3.6 to 18 by 44 scope. The spotter is the guy who finds the targets for the sniper. So it's actually the spotter, not the sniper, that's usually the best sniper in the team. Finally, there's the team lead. This soldier carries an M4 rifle as well as radios and laptop computers that the team needs to function. That's right, the team can send back voice, data, and video. And he's normally a sergeant and has risen through the ranks as a sniper and a spotter. It's the team leader's job to emplace the sniper team, set up security and watch rotations, as well as report back to higher command on what they see. The team lead also carries a handheld Kestrel weather sensor. This device holds all the ballistic data needed for the sniper's MRAD rifle. But I'll get to ballistic data in a moment and note that sometimes the spotter might actually carry the Kestrel. The team leader has a major role in mission planning and preparation as well. This includes direct involvement in coordinating with all the S shops or staff shops, it's like the S2 intelligence shop or the S3 operation shop. The team leader is also involved in planning artillery fire missions with target reference points in support of the area of operations. And finally, the team leader will also coordinate with the company or platoon leadership if they are part of an attachment in support of their mission. The sniper team normally operates out of a sniper section. This is typically a 10-man section operating out of an infantry battalion scout platoon for a total of three teams, although this can vary based on manning. The section is led by the sniper section leader, who is typically an army staff sergeant with about 8 to 14 years of experience. The section leader also advises the battalion commander on how best to employ sniper and ISR, or intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, assets. Now, a battalion commander is typically a lieutenant colonel, so not only must the sniper leader be tactically proficient, but he needs to be tactful when dealing with officers, especially when the section leader knows far more about how to employ snipers than the battalion commander does. Typically, the section leader will come up with some sort of Denny's menu of options for the battalion commander on how to employ snipers, and the commander will pick one of those options. Now the real work begins. The sniper section leader and his team start their troop leading procedures. They plan and coordinate multiple routes into and out of the target area. They notify supporting units of where there will be, and they even check the local temperature. Okay, not just the weather temperature, but the temperature of the local population. 
Are they supportive of friendly forces? What does the target look like? What is and what is not normal when it comes to civilian behavior in an area? The section leader also coordinates for class one or food and class five or ammunition. How many days are they gonna be out? How many batteries will they need for the radio or the laptop? And then there's water. The average soldier needs roughly a gallon of water per day and more if it's hot. And every gallon of water weighs 8.34 pounds. So if you're gonna be out for five days, you're gonna be humping one third of your body weight in water. What will the weather be like? What's the camouflage of the target site like? Are there leaves on the trees? Is it a change in season? All of this can change the kind of sniper camouflage that a sniper might use. Now, when it comes to camouflage, snipers typically employ a ghillie suit. These are suits that are typically made of burlap or jute. They are very effective in breaking up the outline of a sniper. However, the suits are hot and hard to move in. They also retain water and sweat, so it can be like wearing a wet blanket in some weather. The Army does issue ghillie suits to their snipers, or you can buy one, but in the same way that a Jedi must construct their own lightsaber, one sniper instructor said to me, You can buy one. Um, a sniper buying a ghillie suit is like Gordon Ramsay going to Sonic. You just don't do it. Now, once you have all of your supplies, you have to prepare for insertion. This can be done in a number of ways. You may be inserted by helicopter, or you can get dropped off by a convoy, or you might even leave your base at night and start walking to the target. As you approach the target, you have to think in multiple dimensions. Do you have overhead cover from enemy drones? Can the adversary see you on thermals? If you're in an urban environment, how high up do you need to go? Ideally, you want to be high up enough to see the target but not so high that it'll take you too long to get down if you have to escape. You also don't want to be in a totally obvious place like a rooftop or a steeple unless absolutely necessary. When picking buildings, snipers tend to stay deep inside the room in the shadows. They never stick their barrel out the window and they love buildings with balconies because they create all sorts of angles and shadows that can misdirect the human eye. When operating in a field environment, the sniper always moves in a W as they approach their target. The human eye picks up lateral or side-to-side -side movement really well, but it's much harder to pick up movement toward or away from you. So when a sniper needs to move laterally or perpendicular to the target, they will move forward, only moving a few degrees to the oblique, and then moving backwards again, just a few degrees to the oblique. Think of it like a big, slow W. And they keep doing this until they're in their new position. This is why being a sniper is hard and fatiguing. Once the sniper gets into their position, they're going to be there for a while. If they have to pee, they're doing it in a Gatorade bottle. If they have to poop, it's usually in an MRE ration bag. And then they have to pack all that stuff out with them. Now, the sniper team will then observe the target and call up information. They are much more likely to call in artillery or an airstrike than take a shot with their rifle. But if they have to take a shot, a few things come into play. The first is target identification. An officer is typically a good target. An enlisted man washing his car is not. When it comes to finding good officers to target, you need to observe the behavior of the surrounding soldiers. Who are the soldiers deferring to? Is one of them carrying a radio or less equipment? Does one of them have a better watch or a better cell phone or cool looking sunglasses? The team is also looking for heavy weapons and radio operators, anything that can reach out and touch them as they are servicing the target. Take out the radio and you can deal with the enemy troops at your leisure. Now the sniper team also has to know a number of things before taking the shot. This is known as DOPE, or Data on Previous Engagements. Snipers always carry a DOPE card, which they typically Velcro to the wrist of their inner arm. The DOPE card holds all backup targeting DOPE data in case the information in the Kestrel fails. Now, snipers have gathered all of this DOPE from shooting their rifles again and again and again while practicing on the range. So they know exactly where to adjust the elevation dials on their rifle to hit a target at a known distance. Every barrel is different and every barrel behaves differently as it warms up. So snipers have dope for taking shots from cold or unfired barrels, but they also have dope for taking shots from warm barrels, which are barrels that have been fired or a couple of successive shots. Now, 
Getting the range of the target can be done in a few different ways, but it's typically done with a laser rangefinder. But there is another way. Okay, I have to explain some math here, but it's actually pretty simple. Everybody knows that there's 360 degrees in a circle, but at long ranges, degrees are just too big. If you're off course by just one degree, after one foot, you'll miss your target by two tenths of an inch. Not a big deal. After 100 yards, you'll be up by 5.2 feet and you'll miss the target. And this only grows as the distance increases. So the Army uses mills or milliradians. There's 6,283 milliradians in a circle, but even that's too big at long ranges. So typically mills are broken down into one tenths on a rifle scope. So one mill equals one yard at 1,000 yards. And one mill is also one meter at 1,000 meters. It actually doesn't matter whether you use metric scale or standard scale, and that's the beauty. At 100 yards, a 0.1 mil click is 0.36 of an inch. And if you use metric, one tenth of a mil equals one centimeter at 100 meters. For this example, I'm gonna use inches because I'm American and I think in inches, but it'll work in centimeters as well. So the formula is this, the size of the target in inches by a constant, which is 25.4, divided by the target measurement in mils, which gives you your range of the target in yards. So if you know the average height of the soldier is 70 inches, all you have to do is sight your rifle in on the soldier and count the number of mils. In this case, the soldier is four mils in height, so the soldier is 444 yards away. Now, the sniper can adjust their scope to the correct range and fire. When it comes to wind, things get a little harder. Wind from the front or back is usually preferred. Wind at the oblique or coming in at 90 degrees is fine too because there's tables you can use to compensate for that. Half and quarter values like coming in from a slant is bad and so is shifting or gusting wind. So a sniper might take a pause and wait for the wind to die down before firing. Also note that the wind might be different when the bullet leaves the barrel midway down the path of the bullet and at the target. Now, for the wind at the firing position, the sniper usually has his handy kestrel. In an urban environment, the team leader may go outside or go up on the roof to get the wind. Downrange, the sniper might rely on the Beaufort wind force scale. This was originally developed by Sir Francis Beaufort of the Royal Navy to describe the conditions of sails, but now it's used to estimate wind speed by looking at common objects. For example, if smoke is rising vertically, the wind is calm. If you feel the wind on your face and leaves are rustling, the wind is between four and seven miles per hour. If trash is blown around and small branches are moving, wind speed is between 13 and 18 miles per hour. Snipers can also look at mirages. If the heat currents in a mirage are moving straight up, that shows the wind direction is between 6 and 12 o'clock. If the mirage waves are moving at an angle, you know the direction the wind is moving. Now, if the wind at the target is different than the wind at the sniper's position, the sniper implements an acronym called SWAG, or Scientific Wild Ass Guess. They might miss the first shot, but they'll use the data from that miss to hit the target on the second shot. The sniper is also thinking about what is in front of, behind of, and to the sides of their target. If he misses, where is the target likely to seek cover? Where is that target going to go, and will his ammunition penetrate the cover if he takes a follow-up shot? Snipers also don't do headshots. They fire center mass or at the largest portion of an exposed body. If they don't have a good shot, they may displace and find a more advantageous spot to shoot from. Now, ideally, the sniper never takes multiple shots from the same location, but in reality, mission and terrain dictate. If you've taken a shot and your mission is complete, you will displace and move back for extraction. When you get back to base, you'll debrief the commander or the S2 or intelligence officer on your mission. You'll also clean your weapons and prepare for the next time you go out again. Now, keep in mind, there's a difference between COIN or counterinsurgency and LISCO or large-scale combat operations. Chief Petty Officer Chris Kyle, the famous American sniper of book and movie fame, has 160 confirmed kills to his credit, and the number is possibly much higher. But Chief Kyle also had luck. He always seemed to be in the right place at the right time. In a future Lisco conflict, it is highly doubtful the sniper will have as many kills with his rifle as Chris Kyle did. Coin is about kills. Lisco is much more likely to be about observation and calling in artillery or airstrikes rather than shooting with your rifle. 
So while they might not have as many kills with their rifle as Chris Kyle, they might have even more from long range precision fires. Now, that being said, with the current conflict in Ukraine and the use of drones, what does the future hold for snipers? Well, the sniper has something that drones do not have, persistence. A sniper can stay in the field observing an adversary for weeks at a time. And that's just not something that drones can do. Drones also have an electronic signature. We need to think in multiple spectrums. And a drone is a pretty big target on the electromagnetic spectrum. When fighting against a peer or near peer adversary, we can assume this adversary will have electronic warfare capability that is near to or equal to our own. So setting up a drone might be the same as lighting up a bonfire, telling the enemy exactly where you are and where you plan to go. Snipers don't have that problem. They are stealthy and can use satellite or burst radio transmissions to send voice and data back to decision makers. So if snipers are so useful, why is the Marine Corps getting rid of the snipers in their infantry battalions? Well, remember how I said that in a LISCO environment, you're much more likely to call for artillery than take a shot. The Marine Corps may be divesting itself from snipers and their infantry battalions, but they're giving those infantry battalions additional scouts and increasing their long range precision fires. So the Marine still has a sniper rifle. It's called a HIMARS. Now there's a number of people I would like to thank for this video, but all of them want to remain anonymous except for one. Staff Sergeant Logan Hallmark of the U.S. Army Sniper School, who was instrumental in making this video happen and gave me that beautiful Gordon Ramsay quote. I also want to thank the Fort Benning Public Affairs Office for inviting me down to the school to see how this amazing school works. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to support the channel, head on over to Bunker Branding and buy a t-shirt or a hoodie. And if you don't wear t-shirts or hoodies, toss me five bucks on my sub stack. It helps pay for trips like this to sniper school. And thank you so much for watching. Hey everyone, new Ryan Macbeth t-shirts and hoodies from Bunker Branding are available. I'm going to get the High Mars shirt. What are you going to get, Donald? The Patriot shirt, because I'm a Patriot. It's the best shirt, the biggest shirt. Make 14 tangos great again. What are you going to get, Barack? Let me be clear. I'm going to get a drone sweet drone shirt. What about you, George? I'm going to get a knife hand shirt because they're weapons of mass destruction. What about you, Billy? Oh, I'm going to get a landmine marker shirt because my presidency always blew up in my face. I'll tell you what I'm going to get. Ronald Reagan, but you're dead. I came back to tell you that no matter our politics, we're all Americans. And we should buy Ryan's hoodies and t-shirts because they pay for the stock footage and licenses that allow him to make awesome content. So come on down to Bunker Branding and buy a Ryan Beth t-shirt or I'll start the bombing in five minutes.